This is the third in a five-part series of, of webinars that PDG is rolling out along with the new uh, chapters of its blueprint. On the next slide, you can see the additional sessions that we have held and will be holding. I believe, yep, perfect. Um, uh, the prior sessions, uh, those video recordings for sessions one and two are now posted and available on the PDG website, dscsagovernance.org forward slash blueprint. So uh, again, those recordings are available and these future recordings will be made available as well. Please note there is separate registration for each webinar. So if you still would like to join us for the tracing and credentialing sessions and have not done so yet, uh, encourage you to use those registration links on that website to register for those two additional sessions as well. Next slide. Uh, I'm joined by uh, a couple of our guests here today. Uh, first, uh, Mike Mazur, Director of Trade Operations at Pfizer. Uh, Mike was one of the co-leads of our verification workgroup within PDG, and we're excited to have his commentary uh, as a manufacturer with us here today. Uh, Unfortunately, Scott Mooney is not able to join us today. Scott is under the weather, as some folks know, and so uh, we appreciate Scott's input kind of put, helping us put this together. Scott also serves as one of those co-leads of our verification work group and has been instrumental in this work, but we'll, we'll miss his insights here today. And finally, uh, Bob Celeste, founder of the Center for Supply Chain Studies, uh, who has uh, joined us on prior sessions as well and provided much of the technical guidance and input in facilitating the workgroup activity uh, to put this chapter uh, and the other chapters of the blueprint together. So appreciate you all joining us today and being part of this conversation. First, just a, a real quick background for folks that may not be familiar. PDG uh, is an organization, a collaborative forum, and an FDA public-private partnership focused on developing, advancing, and sustaining efficient models for interoperability under the DSCSA. And uh, really, the, the core strength of the organization lies in its membership. And you can see our members on the next slide uh, representing all sectors of the supply chain, manufacturers of, of various types, wholesalers, repackagers, third-party logistics providers, and dispensers of various types as well, as well as a unique opportunity to collaborate with many technical experts and solution providers throughout the industry as well. And these folks have been working for the last two and a half years to develop this shared vision for interoperability under the DSCSA. Really, the culmination of that work is our blueprint, which is available on our website, uh, again, dscsagovernance.org forward slash blueprint, uh, and includes now uh, all six chapters of the complete blueprint, including both the business and compliance requirements and the functional design requirements of each of the DSCSA components. It's those last five chapters that we're working through in our sessions here on this webinar. Uh, this is just a reminder of the process that went into that blueprint. And so, as we've mentioned, if you've been with us on prior sessions, there's a lot of technical detail in that blueprint document. And uh, don't want folks to be discouraged if you start to get lost in some of that content. And we encourage folks really just to keep in mind the process that went into the development of that documentation. That blueprint is the culmination of uh, more than 275 workgroup sessions with thousands of hours of input uh, from all of our sectors, engagement with the FDA, a consensus process, a voting process, and a supermajority general membership voting process to get that document across the finish line. And so uh, while you may take issue with certain parts of it or, or some of it may be at a level of technical detail beyond your area of focus individually, I hope you'll recognize that it's a, a document that has been produced through a very extensive uh, process that, that uh, solicited and incorporated the input of some of the best and brightest minds throughout the industry. Uh, again, just a, a reminder for folks who may not have been with us on our prior sessions, these, this is kind of how the six chapters of the blueprint build upon each other. That first chapter published in 2021 really set forth the compliance and business requirements uh, that, that PDG views for DSCSA interoperability in 2023. And then chapter two, which we covered in our first webinar series, uh, was it kind of sets out the, the general functional design uh, concept for interoperability with the four additional chapters building on that general functional design with specif specific uh, design criteria around TI exchange, verification, tracing, and credentialing. 
And it's that fourth component uh, in chapter four there of PI verification uh, that we'll be focused on here in today's session. So before we jump into some of the conversation with, with Mike and Bob here today, I first just want to do a little bit of scope setting and background on the statute for folks that may not be as familiar. First, just a, a point uh, with regard to some terminology. There uh, are a couple ways in which the general term verification gets used colloquially in the conversations within industry, as well as in the statute. Uh, and there's a, a distinction here between, as we use these terms, product identifier verification and verification systems. Product identifier verification is really what our chapter and our functional design is focused on, that interoperable electronic component to confirm the validity of a product identifier affixed to a product. So product identifier, again, that, that four element barcode that has GTIN, serial number, lot, and expiry. The process for validating and confirming that, that four, those four data elements were affixed and assigned by the manufacturer versus the broader concept of verification systems, which FDA sometimes uses and is used in the statute to refer to uh, a more comprehensive set of systems and processes to determine and identify suspect and illegitimate product, investigate those product, uh, file and notify uh, trading partners of illegitimate product and other similar process types of controls. Many of those processes are internal business processes and therefore are not the focus of our work specifically in PDG. So we're really focused on that left side product identifier verification. I'll also say one thing that this is that is kind of separate and apart from both of these uh, is the notion of um, I will call it a TI or data reconciliation. So that process where a trading partner may do some sort of a check to confirm based on the product identifier that a physical product it holds corresponds to the transaction information that it received for that product. Uh, more commonly, that is now starting to be referred to in industry, I think, as reconciliation. But sometimes that the term verification gets used loosely in conversation to reference that. We are not talking about that kind of a process either, where you're matching product to your TI. Again, we're really focused on that product identifier verification component. I wanted to then also just share a little bit of kind of the statutory background just to, to for folks who may not be as close or familiar to some of the background here. Uh, this is the, the statutory definition of verification. Again, really an, an emphasis on determining whether that product identifier, those four data elements imprinted on the package, correspond to the, the four elements that were assigned to it by the manufacturer or repackager. So that's our, our baseline statutory definition, uh, again, focused on that product identifier verification piece. Where the statute starts to get a little bit of interesting and, and diverges from some of the other concepts in the statute is kind of how it's set up. It really puts an emphasis on manufacturers having the ability to respond to verification requests. So a few important concepts that are in the requirements for manufacturers. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll lay out some of the implications here and then Mike, I may come to you in a second here just to provide some perspective on that. But uh, first is uh, this notion that it's referencing requests from an authorized trading partner of various types there who have possession or control of the product. And the obligation here is on the manufacturer to respond to that request within 24 hours. And so there's a few important implications here. First is that a manufacturer must respond if it is an ATP with possession. So that obligation that went in those circumstances when uh, a manufacturer must respond is to an ATP with possession. Note there's no limit here on why an authorized trading partner is making that ask. You know, things like tracing and TI requests have a certain parameters as to the reasons for which you can ask. There's really no statutory limitation on why one of those trading partners may ask a verification to be done. Uh, and also it speaks to those circumstances when a manufacturer must respond. 
that leaves open the possibility uh, that as a matter of business practice, a manufacturer may choose to respond outside of this context. So for example, nothing in the statute prohibits a manufacturer from responding to a patient's request um, to verify a product identifier, but they're not statutorily obligated to do so. So those are some important, I think, just concepts and, and implications of the statute here as you think about your verification uh, systems and processes. Mike, as you think about those kinds of uh, implications there, particularly that you maybe that distinction between those circumstances when you must respond and those times when you may respond or your flexibility to respond, uh, are there particular ways in which that is played out at the manufacturer level that are important for folks to understand and recognize? Yeah, Eric, I mean, from our perspective is, you know, if we get a verification from an authorized trading partner, we're obligated to respond to that, uh, that verification request within 24 hours. Certainly, uh, you know, the authorized status, you know, that's the big question mark, you have credentials out there, you have a GLN, which indicates, you know, that entity, you know, we, we try to verify that it is an authorized trading partner. Uh, and then we would respond to that trading partner. But, uh, you know, certainly, you know, you mentioned uh, outside of, you know, certainly DSCSA, there are potentially, you know, business cases where if we have a patient, if we have an entity that's not an authorized trading partner, you know, certainly, you know, we will, you know, consider those and respond as appropriately. But uh, I think every manufacturer will have its, you know, uh, processes and procedures around, you know, outside of DSCSA, but specifically inside. I think the law is very clear. If a manufacturer gets a request from an authorized trading partner in possession of the product, we have an obligation to respond within 24 hours. Uh, and most manufacturers certainly are part of the VRS network, which is a verification router service, which most solution providers allow access to. And in, in those instances, you know, those verifications will come to a manufacturer and we'll get a sub-second response from that manufacturer, if, you know, as long as the systems are configured correctly and that G10 has the correct endpoint of that manufacturer. But Technic, you know, so the VRS is a sub-second system, whereas, you know, certainly, um, uh, you know, if you pick up the phone and call or, I mean, those, those, but we have an obligation within 24 hours to respond anytime that we get a verification request from an authorized trading partner. Thanks, Mike. Uh, helpful to have that added color to those requirements there. Uh, Next slide, if we could. Uh, another thing, uh, just to tee up then another implication here, right? That that is uh, all on the manufacturer's obligation to respond. There are a couple specific circumstances where uh, other trading must initiate uh, that product identifier verification process. Uh, the first is in the context of a suspect product investigation. So statutorily, as any other trading partner, a wholesaler, a dispenser, a repackager. Um, carries out a suspect product investigation, one piece of, not the complete process, but one piece of that process is performing that product identifier verification. And second, as part of a saleable return process, that product identifier verification must occur. So uh, you know, most often this hits the wholesaler sector, right? Uh, if you're receiving and plan to further resell a returned product, you must incorporate that product identifier verification into that process. Again, the statute does not limit uh, those other circumstances where you may choose to initiate a, a, a product identifier verification, but these are the two circumstances where you must initiate that. The other thing that's important to note there is that if you fail a verification, so if a negative verification comes back, that automatically triggers uh, treating that product as suspect and going through that suspect product process. So if you uh, are doing verification for another purpose and you fail that verification, you automatically kick that product and you get pushed into that suspect product investigation process. And then uh, just finally here then, uh, you know, all of that that we just talked about is existing set of requirements. So that obligation to do those verifications, the obligation for the manufacturers to respond are requirements that are actually in place uh, in being executed today. What changes in November 27th of this year uh, is a little bit lighter than some of the other November 27 requirements, but specifically it's that that verification systems and processes utilize those interoperable electronic systems. 
Mike made reference to the VRS, so that is already well underway within industry, but it's that addition of the electronic interoperability component that is new and unique to the verification process in 2023. Just a couple of uh, key pieces of terminology, again, for folks who may not be as close to this, uh, interoperable verification, we've talked a lot about the scope there on some of those prior slides. In a second here, I'll, I'll tee up two notions that we really emphasize on direct to source and direct to replicate. And then as Mike mentioned, another important term in this space is the VRS, the verification router service, which is that existing method that's been set up through solution providers and through an industry work group facilitated by HDA uh, to put that capability in place through various solutions for its sub-second response, as Mike was noting. So uh, again, uh, there are two core ways within our blueprint that we really emphasize and, and tee up that verification process. And we refer to those as direct to source, where you're going back to the initial source, the manufacturer, or by using TI and TS records received from that manufacturer, which we refer to as direct to replicate. So just to illustrate that uh, for folks who are a little bit more on the visual side, um, uh, this is kind of the, the notion of direct to source here, right? Someone downstream, not necessarily a dispenser, but that's what we've depicted here, going back to that manufacturer with the set of product identifier information and asking that manufacturer to confirm or validate those four elements of the product identifier. Again, G10 serial number, lot, and expiry. So going back to that original source, we refer to that as direct to source. Second uh, is what we call direct to replicate. And so if you do one more click, I think it'll kind of expand a little bit and show this is really about that uh, person who receives information directly from the manufacturer using that data to perform that verification process. Emphasize emphasis here on that data being a true replicate of what you would get in the direct to source mechanism. So rather than going back to the manufacturer, you can use a direct replicate set of that data that the manufacturer would otherwise be using. And there are some certain controls on the next slide that uh, kind of uh, talk a little bit about when and how uh, it may be appropriate to do that direct to replicate, because there are certain circumstances where it's not uh, necessarily appropriate in our view at PDG uh, to use that direct to replicate method. And this was part of chapter one, but I think it's a fundamental piece uh, of the, the verification conversation that we want to just kind of re-highlight for folks. First is that the product needs to be packaged, or excuse me, the purchased directly from the manufacturer. So if you are a couple of steps down the supply chain, you can't, uh, you don't have access to that direct replicate set of data. And so uh, you're not in a position to be able to do, uh, do that verification process to that same level of data. Second, and this is all of these conditions must be met, uh, the trading partner that performs that, again, most often that's going to be a wholesaler, performs it uh, using that commissioning level data provided directly by the manufacturer. Again, emphasis there on making sure it's a true replicate of what the manufacturer would otherwise be using. Third, uh, the trading partner performing the ver verification is only doing so for product in its possession. So the inverse here is kind of the important point, right? This is not a, a notion where you know a dispenser would go to a wholesaler and ask the wholesaler to do the verification on behalf of the manufacturer using that replicate data. It's uh, the trading partner that received the data doing it for that own, their own product that's in their own possession or control. Fourth um, is kind of the use case for verification. So verification, uh, that are for investigation or a suspect illegitimate product or for exceptions where there's an, uh, an error or exception in the data should not utilize direct to replicate. The, the shorthand explanation there is essentially if, if it's significant enough, there's a suspect product in play, you should be going back to the manufacturer directly to that original source to confirm that just given the level of risk associated. And finally, uh, the trading partner that's performing it and the manufacturer have some process to exchange known serial number statuses. We'll talk a little bit later about the role of serial number statuses, but the simple uh, kind of concept here is that you need to have a process to ensure that your data is current 
and would reflect what you would otherwise get by going back to the manufacturer. Uh, what you don't want to have happen is that if you went back to the manufacturer to verify versus doing it yourself, for example, as a wholesaler using direct replicate, that you would get two different answers. So you need to make sure that the data being referenced is in sync so that you get consistent answers regardless of which process um, you want to, to utilize there. Mike, I know this is you know, more important to the wholesalers. And again, we unfortunately lost the insights of, of Scott here today, but um, anything you would just kind of highlight with direct to replicate and the importance of that capability in the supply chain for efficiency purposes? Yeah, for efficiency purposes, I mean, this is data that's within the wholesalers four walls provided directly by that manufacturer to that distributor. It, it's, it's, it's accessible, to, you know, again, in their you know, four walls. So, you know, for verifications for saleable returns, you know, they're able, you know, to certainly use that data from an operational efficiency standpoint and get that product, uh, you know, certainly uh, processed and, you know, returned back to inventory. So from an efficiency standpoint, direct to replicate makes sense. You know, the data is with the, with the wholesaler. If they don't have the data for that product, for that given product, and they ping their internal systems, the wholesalers, you know, will go, you know, you know, the VRS will go back to the source, will go back to the manufacturer to confirm the verification of that product. But, you know, from an operational efficiency, it reduces the, you know, I guess the load on the VRS. It's certainly, you know, it's the you know, verifications that are performed in their systems. Uh, you know, with the exception, if they don't have the data, they go to the manufacturer and the manufacturer will perform that verification on their behalf. Great. Thanks, Mike. Uh, next slide. Uh, so just to put a little bit more. Hey, 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 did, did, did you want me to touch on the uh, yeah, just on the um, uh, the statuses and stuff? I mean, in terms of you are, you know, to us, it's a status. You know, you know, when a manufacturer conducts a recall, when a manufacturer conducts a, um, um, you know, certainly a suspect investigation, we identify that product as suspect. You know, we we update our systems, you know, to reflect that. So in a verification response, we are providing that status. Hey, you know, we verify the serial number. It's either a failed or positive verification, but it also the product is recalled, product is expired, the product is unfit for distribution. So we provide that information as part of that direct to source response to a distributor or to anybody asking for a verification. So that's just an additional step. Those known aspects of that serial number. Um, you know, so we incorporate that as part of a verification response. Sorry, I, I just want to touch on that point on the last slide. Yeah, no, it's a, it's an important point, Mike. Yep, thank you. Um, in terms of kind of our PDG ecosystem and how we're looking to establish that interoperability piece, if you do one more click here, you'll see we've really focused on that direct to source component through the VRS or otherwise leveraging that lightweight messaging standard. So. VRS here is the system uh, that, that's been developed through solution providers and through that work group that I referenced earlier and Mike referenced. The lightweight messaging standard is the standard, the GS1 standard that uh, underlies and is utilized in that VRS method or in that direct to, to replicate context within those constraints that we just, just noted. We recognize right throughout the statute and throughout all components of DSCSA, including verification, uh, there is this notion of alternate methods. And so uh, this is not to suggest that that other alternate methods of verification aren't appropriate or aren't compliant, but just that they fall outside of that defined interoperable network that we're trying to cast the vision for. So the reality is there will be other ways in which manufacturers receive verification requests. You may get it in the context of, a, of an investigation where a trading partner says, hey, we're investigating this and as part of your conversation, they ask you to verify, or they may come in by email. It, those are things that, that manufacturers are going to need to be prepared to manage and respond to, um, but they do fall outside of you know, kind of the interoperable enhanced network that we're trying to cast the vision for. Um, Mike, uh, anything you want to add on kind of those alternative yeah. methods piece? Yeah, I mean, we've been uh, live with verification. Although there's enforcement discretion, manufacturers still have an obligation to respond to a verification request. Most of those verification requests are coming through the VRS, um, but there are a handful that come via email. And it's, it's a tedious process for manufacturers to handle those types of requests coming through email. 
Uh, certainly that email is not just one serial number. There's multiple serial numbers, multiple products. So we have to mainly go in, you know, into our systems and pull the data to ensure that the product identifier in the email matches what we have in our system. And then we respond via that, that email. It's a very inefficient process. And that's why it's outside kind of the, the predefined uh, EDDS network. You know, if, if volumes increase and everybody starts using email versus, you know, you know certainly uh, VRS and some of the other, you know, uh, you know the direct replicate, it, 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 it's going to be challenging to respond within 24 hours. You know, you know, it's a very manual process. So certainly we encourage, you know, certainly all stakeholders that are looking to perform a verification request kind of support the EDDS network that, uh, or I should say the PDG defined EDDS network of VRS as well as direct replicate. Thanks, Mike. And uh, Bob, maybe I'll, I'll bring you in here too. Uh, anything you would highlight about that kind of purple box there? I know you did a lot of the work to help us kind of shape that purple box and in particular, uh, how to think about kind of the VRS and the lightweight messaging standard and that interplay there. Well, Eric, I think I think you had you had said it right. The the VRS makes use of the lightweight messaging standard. And so it, it's supported by that. Um, and and these are you know, verifiable, verifiable ways of, of doing a verification of, of PI information, either direct to source or direct to replicate using information that was uh, initially acquired from the, from the manufacturer or repackager. We'll go into some of the diagrams in a bit that, that kind of exercise this in a detailed way. Yep, we will. Uh, just a couple more quick things before we do turn to those diagrams, as Bob mentioned. First, uh, just a little bit more detail on the point Mike emphasized around statuses. So this is, you know, uh, I think become more understood, but it at least used to be a, a very hot topic on the next slide around uh, when and how you reflect the current serial number status as part of a verification response. So again, the, the idea here is, uh, if you commissioned a serial number, you put that product identifier into the supply chain, and then at some later point, something happens to that product that makes it non-saleable. Uh, it's damaged, it's destroyed, it, it's expired, it got recalled. You know, any of those number of reasons that you may uh, consider that product to be non-saleable, is that part of your verification response? So if that's in the situation, right, do you respond and say, yes, those four elements match, or do you say, sure, they match, but it's been recalled, so it's not saleable, or it's been destroyed, so it shouldn't be in the supply chain. How do you incorporate and account for those serial number statuses? And how do you find that balance between recognizing there's no statutory obligation to maintain and reflect serial number statuses as they go through their life cycle? And it's a very, could be a, a very burdensome process for certain of those statuses to be reflected. Um, while also recognizing we, we don't want to, you know, give a false impression that a product is good when you issue a response verification by just pointing to the, the original commissioning status. And so where we really landed on that issue is that uh, as a PDG perspective, your verification response as a manufacturer repackager uh, must reflect known statuses. We didn't go so far as to say that you have an affirmative obligation to go out and learn statuses and update and reflect statuses. But if you know and are aware of a, a current status of a product, you need to reflect that in your verification response. Ultimately, there are a few statuses that are necessarily going to be known. Uh, the exp an expired product is reflected on the product. You, you, it's a known fact that that product is expired if that's the case. Um, as uh, you know, there are other systems and processes for conveying and notifying trading partners of recalled product and the existence of a 3911, meaning the product is illegitimate or, or a high risk of illegitimacy. There are other processes outside of verification where you're already notifying trading partners that those statuses uh, have changed uh, for recall or 3911 purposes. But there are others where they may not be known, right? A, a product being consumed or destroyed or removed from the supply chain or damaged downstream, you know, a manufacturer may not know that that status has changed. And that's where, you know, we stopped short of suggesting that there should be any sort of affirmative obligation to go out and proactively learn or, or be updated on those kinds of status changes. And so that's kind of the framework that we landed on around really emphasizing those known statuses. Um, 
Mike, it, ultimately, it's the manufacturer who has the, the biggest job in trying to manage that. Anything mm -hmm. else beyond your earlier comments that, that you would really highlight around that process? Yeah, just on the unnecessarily known, certainly the expired recall, fairly straightforward. Um, you know, and there are other processes to notify on recalls, but manufacturers should have an obligation as soon as that notification goes out to go to their repository and update all serial numbers associated with those batches to recalled. Um, I will say, you know, we've been live with the uh, verification responses for the past three years. We've had a few verification responses in which we responded recalled. So there is product out there that potentially could get verified either sale or returns or some other where, you know, that product is recalled and is part of a recall action or market action. So it's critical and certainly manufacturers should look to incorporate the, you know, these elements, you know, in their verification response. And then, the, you know, the third bullet there is subject to a 3911. In, in today's world, I mean, manufacturers do get notified from downstream trading partners. We've gotten notified from some retailers as well as distributors a product of theft, a product that is uh, you know, part of a 3911 and they captured the serial numbers of those products. So as part of those 3911s coming to the manufacturers you know, for, for trading partner notification, we're taking that in and we're updating those serial numbers to a stolen status, to a status that if we got a verification, we would respond negatively and also, you know, quarantine the product, and we would be investigating as to how that product, you know, you know, you know how that trading partner has that product in their possession or control. So, you know, this is important because as we start to exchange serialized data later this year, we'll, we'll know, you know, in, in terms of you know, theft, lost in transit, things of that sort. We will know the the status or the serial numbers associated with those transactions. So, if manufacturers are aware a product has been stolen, we can incorporate that into verification. And, and respond to anybody that wants to do a verification for that um, for that serial number. And then the uh, that may be known or unknown. Again, you know, manufacturers, you know, look. You know, we call it the cradle to grave. You know, we commission and we decommission. And along the way, you know, product gets damaged, product gets, you know, product gets, uh, um, you know, returned. So manufacturers touch that product along that continuum of cradle to grave. But you know, it's, it's one of those things that manufacturers are, are, are you know, it's a strategy on how they manage serial numbers. Uh, unlike the EU where everything gets scanned at dispense in the U.S., it's just, you know, we don't see the entire picture of that product at point of dispense. So that's a big gap where, you know, you know we can't decommission a product at point of dispense because there's no, there's no scanning requirements. But manufacturers, anytime, you know, they touch a product through returns, you know, through damage in our warehouse, through, you know, you name it. You know, we have the opportunity to update the status. So th those are things that manufacturers need to consider. You know, the, the necessarily knowns, you know, certainly, you know, you know, we should be doing that. And the maybe known or unknown, those are all strategies manufacturers need to be thinking about long term as to how they manage, you know, returns back to the reverse logistics, returns that are damaged in the warehouses, potentially, you know, product that's exported overseas. How do you manage the serial number statuses? And those are all questions manufacturers should be uh, discussing internally. All really well said there, Mike, and I'll just highlight kind of one of your early points there, right, about your internal process there, because as you said, it, as an entity, you'll know, hey, this product was recalled or we received a 3911, uh, but making that connection to reflect that in your serial number repository, having that process in place and the importance of that process to make sure that those are connected. Uh, next slide, uh, uh, then you... As we mentioned, you, we really built upon the work that's been done through that VRS work group uh, for that direct to source component. Uh, that's an existing system. We obviously you know, didn't seek to recreate anything and wanted to leverage the work that's been done uh, on that good process. And so what you'll see is a, a large endorsement and incorporation of that VRS work as uh, the functional design for doing that direct to source verification. We did uh, suggest some uh, enhancements there that have been picked up in, in a number of groups and including through the, the GS1 standards process for a few uh, improvements and enhancements as that PI verification uh, through VRS moves from being initially a focus heavily on saleable returns to other use cases. First was uh, for that process to confirm ATP status. So we started there, right? The obligation when you must respond is based on authorized status. And so uh, a way of reflecting and confirming authorized status. And I know Bob will talk a little bit more about that uh, shortly. 
Second was adding to it an attestation of possession or control. Again, one of those pieces that triggers that affirmative obligation to respond. Uh, third, the addition of requester uh, contact information. Uh, so uh, adding to the, the verification request message an email or a phone number so that the uh, manufacturer or repackager can contact that entity outside of the VRS if needed to follow up on anything. And then uh, finally, adding those additional request types to recognize that the VRS and other similar systems will be leveraged uh, for purposes other than just saleable return. It'll be utilized for suspect illegitimate uh, investigations, uh, uh, exceptions, processes, other status checks, et cetera. Um, Bob, I know you were close to some of that work, uh, Mike, as well. Anything you want to add on, on kind of those enhancement components there? No, I think you covered it from my perspective, Bob. Yeah, no, I think you're, I think you're right. Yeah, those uh, extensions allow the other uh, folks in the supply chain, other than the, the uh, wholesaler, to be able to use the VRS for, for these other purposes. Yeah, and Eric, I just, uh, just, I will call out one thing: that requester contact information is critical. <laughs> we receive manufacturers receive verification requests from direct as well as indirect trading partners. And the challenge with indirect is we don't have a direct relationship. So how do we, if we do have a failed verification, it's a suspect product investigation until you can clear it. So we're handling as a suspect. We need to contact, we, you know, we need to have that conversation to understand, did you, you know, did you, in, you know, incorrectly enter it? Did you miss a digit or something? I mean, we, we have to have that conversation, but it's very difficult sometimes to get to the contact person that initiated that verification request. So that requester contact information is a is a huge benefit for manufacturers to be able to kind of quickly, when we do have an exception, a, a failed verification, it's a suspect product, it allows us to get to that right individual so we can have that discussion to determine whether it's illegitimate or we can clear it. So I just uh, want to call that out as I think that is a huge, uh, you know, certainly an improvement. And as we look towards 2023 and we see volume start to pick back up, you know, as we have failures, it's it's an efficient way to be able to kind of you know investigate and close those uh, failures. Great point, Mike. Thanks. Um, I'm going to turn to Bob here in a second. You know, I'll say you know uh, the, this chapter on verification in our blueprint is a little bit unique in that it relies so heavily on existing work in in system work that's been done through other groups previously, um, and so a lot of this information so far, as I mentioned, is is work that's been done uh, leveraged leveraging work that's been done in other groups or was included in our initial chapter. But we do in our our new functional design chapter of our blueprint uh, walk through some of the functional design mapping of this. And so I'll turn now to Bob to, uh, I know these are, are small and difficult to read. And uh, again, the, the idea is less to uh, walk you through these graphics in detail, um, but to orient you to a little bit just to what you'll find in that chapter and why these may be useful uh, reference documents. And so with that, Bob, I'll let you just kind of socialize folks on the next few slides to what mm -hmm. they'll find in that functional design chapter. Sure. So as we included in the document a number of scenarios, and with to, to Eric's point, to the point of uh, being able to show how the interaction occurs between trading partners, and it also gives some insight into some of the thinking or logic within a trading partner's uh, system. So from a direct to replicate, and again, this is where a direct wholesaler is using TITS data that they receive directly from the manufacturer or repackager uh, to verify product. In this case, this is illustrating a, a uh, saleable return that's come in. The direct wholesaler is uh, looking at the TITS data that they receive from the manufacturer and to verify that product. If the verification fails for any reason, then they may perform a direct source verification, which we'll see on the next page. So we can go to that page. And so now you see that the direct wholesaler or the wholesaler or dispenser system uh, in making the ter determination that they need to verify directly with the, the original manufacturer or repackager is, and this is uh, typically done through the VRS system, is making a verification request to the manufacturer and getting a response with those optional status uh, indicators in it also. They then evaluate the response and then uh, decide where to go based on their standard operating procedures. 
if we go to the next. So this is a bit of an eye chart, but this, if you were uh, interested in sort of like what happens behind the scenes if people are using credentials. So credentials are a way for a indirect trading partner or any trading partner to prove to their whoever they're interacting with who they are and, and that they do have authorized trading partner status. Uh, and the thought here is that by providing a credential, uh, you you alleviate the need to go through a process with the other individual to determine identity and, and trading partner status. And so this this uh, illustrates the workings not only of the trading partner systems, the VRS solutions, the digital wallet solutions, and the credential issuers and how they interact with, together and how they use information that each of those provide. You go to the next. So in, in a different way of looking at it, uh, as we look at an interaction between so a, an entity that is attempting to verify product with a manufacturer and a repackager and a manufacturer or a repackager verifying that product, uh, we looked at two different alternatives. One is using credentials. And so along with the verification request, you provide a credential, the manufacturer is able to verify that, that uh, or check that uh, credential with their their wallet uh, provider, and they're able to determine that uh, it is a legitimate credential. You are who you say you are. You do have ATP status at that point, and and they reply with the the response to the verification. At the bottom is uh, a situation where uh, an entity is is requesting a verification. They're not using they're not using credentials. Uh, depending on the situation from the manufacturer repackager side they may need to go through, uh, you know, we're talking about a manual onboarding process in order to, to determine who it is that's asking the question uh, to their level of comfort and whether they are ATP, and then they would then respond to that, that request. So I think that was, I don't know if you had more that you wanted to dig in on yep. on this, this chart. Yeah, I think uh, that that's great, Bob. I appreciate uh, kind of that overview and orientation. I'll come to you, Mike, in just a second on this, but I'll also just flag after that, we'll open it up for questions and answers. And so uh, encourage and uh, welcome folks to start putting any questions that you have for folks uh, into the chat and we'll turn to those here in a second. Uh, Mike, I know this, this credentialing topic is getting a lot of discussion in the industry. Uh, in terms of you know, the value it can provide in assuring authorized trading partner status uh, and how it can support more automated processes like VRS uh, while recognizing there will be an adoption curve to that new technology. So, uh, welcome, Mike, you, your perspective on that ongoing dialogue. I mean, it's an ongoing dialogue and certainly uh, adoption is probably one of the, I mean, when you look at credentials and, and the role of credentials, it certainly gives you confidence when we do get an inquiry, whether it's going to be a tracing request or a verification request, it's an authorized trading partner. You know, we don't have to look at a GLN or we don't have to look at some other identifiers. I mean, credential, you know, you know, you know indicates that is an authorized trading partner. As long as they provide a credential, you, we feel comfortable responding. But again, you know, that's, I, I think that that is, uh, and then that's where we want to get to. You know, certainly coming this November, you know, you know, we will be responding to verifications and trading partners, excuse me, and tracing requests without credentials. I think that it, it's going to be a kind of a mixed environment for a period of time. But eventually, I think industry will eventually migrate to credentials. And it's important for, you know, really any, any, any kind of, you know, uh, re, uh, request that we receive from an indirect trading partner. And again, when I say indirect, you know, we have our direct, we sell to a distributor, we sell to a pharmacy, but it's those entities that we don't have a direct relationship to. Um, you, know, you know, we don't, you know, we can't look up in our system to see, you know, hey, you know, this is their license information. You know, we have, you know, all these transactions associated, these are indirect trading partners. So, you know, having those entities, you know, present their, you know, a, a credential to us gives kind of further, further validation that, you know, that it's a legitimate request and we will respond to that request. But between now, you know, and hopefully when we get to that point where everybody has credentials, it's going to take some time, but I think it's the right thing to do. 